Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Lehigh College of Business and Economics and the annual Grun Distinguished Finance Speaker Series. I'm Georgette Chapman Phillips. I'm the Kevin and Lisa Clay Dean of the College of Business and Economics. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. On behalf of President Simon, all of the CBE faculty and staff, we are thrilled to have you here for the lecture. A special welcome, of course, to our honored speaker, Ann Lunas, class of 19, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, I wouldn't want it to be like broadcast because all of you are Lehigh students, you can do the math. <laughs> and to especially our guests, Don and Judy Grun, who have made this event possible. CBE is pleased to bring nationally and internationally recognized thought leaders such as Ms. Luna's to our campus to address important business topics of the day. We pride ourselves on preparing our students for success. And what better preparation for our students than to meet people who are successful industry leaders. A special place in my heart is for the Gruen Speaker Series. It was established in 2008 and it's just one example of the student educational experience that we offer outside of the classroom. I consider it an absolute honor to introduce Don Grun, and I will give your class the class of 1949. Sorry, Don. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Don. He graduated from Lehigh with a BS in Business Administration while on campus. Don was best friends with Asa Packer and also, <laughs> also active across a wide range of activities, glee club, drama club, men's soccer team, and writer for the brown and white. After more than 40 years in the financial services industry, both as a member of the New York Stock Exchange as well as a general partner in two firms, Don is now enjoying a very well-deserved retirement. Currently, we are so thankful in the way that Don supports Lehigh. I am especially honored to have him as a member of the Dean's Advisory Council for the College of Business and Economics. But his support doesn't end there. He generally supports the general functions of the College of Business and Economics, the Financial Services Lab, the Martindale Society, Zollner Earth Center, Journalism, and Athletic Departments. And in 2004, he and Judy endowed a scholarship fund that annually awards a scholarship to a deserving finance student. That is really the gift that keeps on giving. So all of you out there, just again, you do the math and you figure out when you're going to endow your scholarship. As a result of John and Judy's support, John and, sorry, Don and Judy's, <laughs> Just gave you a new name. As a result of Judy and Don's support of everything Lehigh, they were deservedly inducted on Leadership Plaza in honor, in a, an honor afforded to Lehigh's most gener generous benefactors. Please welcome me, welcome me in joining. Boy, I can't talk today. Something's, I have no good excuse either. I got a good night's sleep, properly caffeinated. Please join me in welcoming Don to the podium to introduce our speaker. Looking towards the back of the room, I think we've broken an attendance record. And Anne, you haven't even spoken yet. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Phillips, for those very kind words. Uh, have you considered Comedy Central? <laughs> <laughs> and good afternoon and a very welcome to our uh, Distinguished Financial Speaker Series. Financial is our middle name always has been. Today, however, financial will be blended with marketing, branding, advertising, and media, key strategies used by a chief marketing officer. 
Today, we're very fortunate to have Ann Lunas, Lehigh Class of 83, and Chief Marketing Officer of Adobe delivering this afternoon's lecture. Ann is considered one of the most creative of today's Chief Marketing Officers. In addition to Marketing Chief, Ann wears an important second hat. She's Executive Vice President of Adobe. The two jobs make her one of the most influential people in Silicon Valley. Born in New York City in 1961, after primary schooling, Anne attended Bronx High School of Science. To this day, one of uh, New York City's finest public high schools. Anne showed an early flair for math and science and was drawn to Lehigh for those reasons. But she also wanted to incorporate her passion for career creativity. She joined Alpha Pi sorority and excelled as a double major in journalism and international relations. She attributes her excellent writing skills to her experience and hard work on the brown and white. One can look back in the archives and find her front page stories on Lehigh's gift campaigns and the 1980 Iranian hostage crisis, among others. Did you remember that? Graduating in 1983, our speaker didn't hang around the East Coast very long. After a two-year stint nearby at Rodale Publishing in Emmaus, PA, she headed west to California. Rumor has it that she drove the entire 3,000 miles. Ann was offered a marketing job at Intel the largest U.S. manufacturer of computer memory chips, arriving at just the right time when the PC industry was taking off. Anne and her team played a key part in what is considered one of television's most creative advertising campaigns. At this time, computer companies were spending furiously major bucks on television commercials to sell their products. Big names like Compaq, HP, Dell, IBM. Now, they all used Intel chips. And sitting in plain view at the bottom of the television screen in every commercial by these companies were two words, Intel inside. Those two little words, an enormous yet quiet impact. That brilliant campaign truly branded what I guess, sorry Anne, was not a very exciting product, microprocessors. Timing and leadership, that's everything according to Anne Lunas. She joined Intel at the right time with the right boss, learning on the job through different roles. Having stayed in Intel for 20 years, Anne decided, time to move on, and she's been at Adobe for over 10 years. Our speaker has been such an uber achiever that I am not planning to touch on Anne's exciting initiatives at Adobe, since I have a feeling that she will be re recounting a number of them. I do want to mention, besides all her work at Adobe, our speaker also serves on the board of the Advertising Council and serving as well on the board of directors of Mattel, America's giant toy company. I'd like to read two short but personal messages I received about Anne. I quote, sadly I only overlapped a short period of time with Anne, but I strongly believe that she has taken Adobe's marketing to a whole new level. These words from Bruce Chisholm, former Chief Executive Officer of Adobe, and from Professor Jack Lully, Iacocca Chair of our Journalism and Communications Department. I quote, Anne is an exceptional role model for the young women of Lehigh, but especially for the young women in the business of journalism, media, and communication. In those fields still dominated by men, Anne has shown how to succeed 
with hard work, perseverance, grace, dignity, and humor. And continues to generally support Lehigh's journalism department, not just with resources, but with time and energy. Every summer, she makes sure that a Lehigh journalism major is selected for one of the very prestigious Adobe internships in Silicon Valley. On a personal level, Anne met her husband, Greg Welch, at Intel, and they are the parents of twin boys. Now, don't think for a minute that this job doesn't come with fun perks. This past March, ladies, listen to this. This past March, Anne appeared on stage at the Adobe Summit in Las Vegas in front of 10,000 guests and conducted a one-on-one -on -one interview with a gentleman named George Clooney. <laughs> it is such a pleasure for me to introduce this multi-talented lady. She's going to take you shortly from Lehigh to Silicon Valley. One of our very own, Ann Lunas, Lehigh 83. Okay. A wonderful uh, late news flash oh. that I would like to share with our audience came in yesterday, but as of today, November 15th, Anne has been named the eighth most innovative chief marketing officer in the country. This through the very popular financial site, uh, Business Insider. And this is great news and a fabulous and well-deserved honor. And Thank I wanted you. to share it with everybody. <laughs> Do you have water? Thank you. I <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Don for his incredible generosity in inviting me here today, and also President Simon. It is literally thrilling to be here, and I hope I don't, I'm all choked up, so hopefully I won't start crying on stage. But this is an enormous welcome, and I'm, I'm so incredibly uh, pleased and grateful to be here. So. Um, I met with, I don't know, maybe 30 students over the, over the past few hours, and I have to tell you how incredibly I, impressed I am with all of you. I met some journalism students, some marketing students, some finance students, and honestly, I just, I can't say enough about how well-spoken, how determined, passionate, I was telling um, uh, Pooja Prasad, who's here with me, the practicality and the ambition and just the sheer determination of the students I met with, if any of you are here, I am leaving very, very impressed. So good for you all. Okay, give yourselves a hand. Come on. What a great group. Okay, so um, I graduated 33 years ago. I know I don't look that old, but I am that old. And I have learned a lot since then. Uh, and there are four key things that I think have really shaped me and my career. And over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, you'll see these themes woven in um, to how I became who I am. Um, first is taking risks. Second, delivering results, thinking creatively, and last and probably most important, working well with people. So, just a little bit about me. So I, I did grow up in New York City, and um, I did go to the Bronx High School of Science. I was always interested in science and math, but I was more of a creative kind of arty kid. I was in a band. I um, was always on the school newspaper, on yearbook. I loved drama. So um, it was an interesting um, choice for me to potentially come to Lehigh. And my clicker, hopefully, will progress. There we go. So I chose Lehigh because it was very different than what I was used to. I had never been to a high school football game before I came to Lehigh because my school was a very urban public school in New York City, and we didn't have a football team. 
I had never had any exposure to the Greek system. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Animal House, which came out shortly before I came to Lehigh, and that was my vision of what fraternity life was like. So I was very green, but this ended up being an incredibly good choice for me. It was small enough that I could be very involved in a lot of different things, and I could make an impact here. I learned to ask very good questions, to be a very fast writer, um, and uh, very deadline-driven at the Brown and White. I learned great leadership skills and how to work well with others at Alpha Phi. And I, uh, yeah, are there Alpha Phi's out there? There are no Alpha Phi's? Oh, there they are. How you doing? Uh, and I totally used all my social skills there. I was the rush chairman of Alpha Phi. I got the best class ever. And then I had my first great work experience through an internship that I did at Rodale Publishing just, just down the road. I worked there about 10 or 20 hours per week during my senior year. I was a fact checker there. That was like basically the lowest possible job. And while I was there, the magazine that I was working on, which was called Spring, it was a, it was a very advanced concept, a women's health magazine 30 years ago, which had absolutely no traction and unfortunately went under while I was working there. But they gave me other wonderful things to do during my internship. And I worked hard, and I was a good student. And um, it just all around was, was a great experience for me. However, when I graduated in 1983, the economy was bad, really, really bad. Unemployment had hit an all-time high of 9 million, which was the highest number since the Great Depression. And there I was, a new college graduate, looking for a job in publishing. So um, I had two roommates from Lehigh, two fellow Alpha Phi's that moved out to Silicon Valley. And uh, they invited me to come uh, for a year. And I thought, oh, I'm from New York City. No one ever leaves New York City. But maybe I'll try Silicon Valley. So I drove my Honda Civic, and I did do that. My mom and I drove nearly 3,000 miles. And it was a huge risk for me. My mother dumped me off in Sunnyvale, California. And she left me. <laughs> and it was like a huge risk to leave my family, my friends, and every single thing I knew. And I thought I would try it for a year. And that was 31 years ago. So I ended up on my friend's couch with no job. I was this really good student. And here I was. I was literally sleeping in Sunnyvale, California on a couch. I thought Silicon Valley was near the beach because it was in California. It was nowhere near the beach. I um, was surrounded by an orange orchard on one side and a semiconductor company on the other side of my very small apartment complex. And it didn't rain, literally, for the first six months that I was there. So I missed home. So after two weeks in my apartment complex at the pool, because it was like 75 degrees every single day, I went to a place called the Palo Alto Women's Resource Center. And I paid a dollar, one dollar, to look through a job search binder. Literally, it was like a hand, you know, there were little laminated pieces of paper telling you about jobs. And there were two jobs that sounded, you know, particularly good for a journalism major. One was at Sunset Magazine, which I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's kind of a Western living um, type magazine. It was similar to what I had done at Rodale. And one was at Intel. So. Um, I'd never heard of Intel. I'd never heard of semiconductors. Um, Intel was about a billion dollars in revenue at the time, and it was really struggling. Uh, as Don mentioned, it was a memory semiconductor company, and memory semiconductors had basically become completely commoditized, and Intel was investing in something brand new called microprocessors. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm seriously that old. So the first month I was there, I'm all excited, and I get my little chair in a long line of cubicles, and um, I walk in, and half of the cubicles are empty because there's been a huge layoff because the semiconductor business was doing terribly. So I got a good job, though, uh, working on the internal employee publication. I was a manager. I had one employee. He was great. My boss was great. 
he completely encouraged me to do uh, whatever I wanted to do there. And he had given me some great advice, which I'm still trying to listen to, which is, and don't go to the mat for everything, because I was really um, anxious to kind of move up. I was very unique at Intel. I was um, a communications, strong in communications among kind of a sea of nerds. And I could have used that um, to complain, but instead I used that to advantage, my advantage, and that's been a huge advantage being in Silicon Valley. I was really excited by what was happening at Intel. The PC revolution was happening, young people were changing the world. If you watch the sitcom Silicon Valley, you always hear Silicon Valley people going, we're changing the world, we're making the, be the world a better place. And we actually believe that out there, um, silly as it sometimes sounds. So, just one anecdote. Um, my peer, who was running our customer magazine, I was running the internal magazine, decided to go take another job. And he was a guy a couple years older than me. And uh, he said, I'm leaving, Anne, and if you apply for this job, I just want you to know that they're paying me $36,000. I was like, $36,000? They're paying me $27,000. So he said, so if you get this job, make sure that you ask them to pay you $36,000. So they give me the job, and of course, nobody says that it's $36,000, so I'm making my 27, and I um, walked into my manager, and I said, John Rant said you paid him $36,000, and I want my $36,000. And he said, of course, we'll give you $36,000. So early lesson, you need to advocate for yourself. And especially in Silicon Valley, that's how things get done. So I got a big break four years later. I was thinking of moving back east, and going to business school. But at the time, Andy Grove, who was our CEO and a real visionary who unfortunately just passed away, was looking um, for someone to work on a project with his assistant. His assistant was um, a man named Dennis Carter. He was a double E with a master's in double E and a Harvard MBA, and he was an absolute genius. And he had this crazy idea that he had sold to Andy Grove. His idea was to market microprocessors to consumers. Every consumer should know microprocessors, and rather than being excited by buying an IBM PC, they should be excited about getting a PC with Intel microprocessors in it. I was like, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. Nobody is ever gonna go for that. And he said, give me six months, I have five million dollars to invest in this, and let's see if we can make a go of it. So, um, I did it, and he taught me everything I know. I never went back to business school. He was my on-the-job MBA. He taught me, um, I studied, he made me read textbooks, I worked tirelessly, and um, I traveled the world, and the company just continued to grow. So I was doing well there, um, and I did every kind of marketing job, from PR to advertising to retail marketing, uh, and I did meet my husband there. But to be truly successful at Intel, you needed to be a general manager. And um, in order to be a general manager, you needed to move around into different disciplines. If you're familiar with what GE does, they typically take you know, talented employees and they kind of forcibly move them every two years. You're in kind of a management training program. And that's how Intel operated as well. So my boss told me I would need to make a choice. I could be a, a career marketer, which he really advised me against, or I could move into another kind of role. I could move into product management, I could move into sales, I could go work in a region. And I thought long and hard about it, and I said, what do I really want to do? What is my passion? And I realized I was a creative person, and I really wanted to be in marketing. And so I made the choice then that I would stay in marketing. And I did it, um, I think, very thoughtfully. So after 20 years, I thought, I have done all I can do here from a marketing perspective. And Andy Grove had left, my mentor had left, very important to me and again, um, people are so important in your work life and you really want to work with people that you enjoy and who you can learn from. They had left, the company was now a $40 billion company. When I started, it was a $1 billion company. And it kind of got too big for me. And to me, um, it, it lost a little bit of the soul that I thought that we had first had. 
And so I didn't think I could make a big difference anymore, and I needed a change. So I decided to take another risk. And that was Adobe. So um, the CMO, the chief marketing officer of Adobe, was retiring, and uh, she called me. I knew her vaguely, and she said, Anne, there's an opportunity to replace me. Are you interested? And I said, oh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm really happy here at Intel. And Intel's one of those places, it's like a black hole. Once they suck you in, they rarely push you out. And so uh, my husband actually just left there after 23 years. So I wasn't inclined to move. However, I had really good feelings about Adobe. And um, it was a creative software company. And I was this creative person who had been working at a semiconductor company and doing very creative things. But um, I felt like the right place for me might be this new kind of creative software company. I thought their brand was severely under leveraged, so I went for an interview with the CEO. I talked to a lot of people there, and I had a really good feeling, but I would be leaving a place that you know, I knew very well. So my CEO, who's my boss, interviewed me three times. And at the last interview, I said, listen, I've been here three times. Are you going to hire me or not? Because I can't keep leaving my job for an hour if you're not going to hire me. And he said, Anne, I want to make sure that you really like us and that we really like you. And I thought this was really remarkable for the CEO of a company to care that much about the fit of the employee and to really like look inside and see what kind of a person was I and how would I contribute, and how would he enjoy working with me. And I did get the job, and that was 10 years ago. So, over the past 10 years, Adobe has completely transformed. Um, we have always had a mission to change the world through digital experiences, and most of you probably know us through products like Photoshop. That commercial I showed you earlier was for Photoshop. But what many people don't know is the big role that Adobe products play in every single digital experience you have. Whether you're streaming the next Lehigh Lafayette game on your tablet, I know the big game is on Saturday, so hopefully you'll all be there live, but if you're not, you'll be able to do this thanks to Adobe. Whether you're booking your next flight home on your app or watching the latest episode of Stranger Things, Adobe products are helping you do that and making those experiences happen. So, seven years ago, Adobe took a risk. And a bunch of us had come to Adobe from larger companies, um, and we were all anxious to really see the company take a new turn and, and drive significant growth. And so we decided to literally completely change our business. Our creative business revenue was plateauing, and we needed to make a dramatic shift to both drive revenue up, but also get more predictability in the revenue. Because the way that the business model worked is you would buy a new package of Adobe software, literally a package, every 18 to 24 months whenever we had a new version of software. And so every 18 to 24 months, we'd see a spike in revenue. And then after that, there'd be a dip, and it would plateau. So what this did, two things. One, it led to serious unpredictability in our revenue. And so we were only getting spikes and ebbs. And second, we have all these brilliant engineers at our company who are waiting for 18 to 24 months in order to spit out new technology, new features, new services, new products. The engineers were holding on to those for two years, which really was not very um, valuable to our customer base. So at the same time, we decided we wanted to enter into a completely new business, digital marketing. So web analytics and data analytics, um, which a lot of people looked at and said, why would they go into that? They're a software company. But um, our CEO was very prescient, and he said, if we're in the content creation business, and we're making web content, we're making videos, aren't people going to want to see how those, are, how those are doing and the impact of those? So literally simultaneously, we did two things. We said, we're not going to make, make package software anymore, which was crazy, again, crazy idea because a lot of our customers liked having their box of software. And we said, we're going to move to a subscription business, and we're going to charge monthly for our software, rather than making you pay up front $800 for Photoshop or $3,000 to buy all of our creative products. We'll let you pay anywhere between $10 and $50 a month for our software. And what ended up happening was the 3 million people who had been buying our products all along turned into 8 million people because they were able to afford our software and students, 
people in other markets, we're finally able to get access to software. In addition, our digital marketing business, because of the whole web revolution and the app revolution, that really started to take off, and we acquired a lot of companies, and now we're the leader in that category, in web analytics, in um, media analysis, in content management, all these big categories. And all this happened over a very, very short time frame. So the results are, are pretty staggering. We are now growing 20% year over year, which for a traditional software company is pretty unheard of. Those are the kinds of rates you see from small startups, but rarely from established companies that are over 30 years old. Our, rec our recurring revenue, and that's again, back to the predictability. So every, every month we're seeing kind of a much more stable, but actually high growth business. We used to have 10% uh, recurring revenue, and now we have 80% recurring revenue, which makes Wall Street extremely happy. And thus, our stock price has only gone in one direction over the past five years. We're also one of the fastest growing brands in the world, and we're consistently recognized for all of our innovation, leadership, and very progressive business practices, like we were the first company to really offer very, very generous parental leave policies. So the company, literally in the past seven to 10 years, is a completely different company. And it's because people were focused on taking calculated risk, driving strong results, thinking creatively, and getting along with each other. So, what do I do? I'm the chief marketing officer, and thankfully, marketing has played a pretty major role in the transformation of the business. My primary responsibilities, how many marketing majors are out there? I met some earlier. Okay, there they are, there's a shot. You guys gotta put your hands up. It's something to pr be proud of. So my primary responsibilities are driving brand strength, growing um, demand for our different products, and then a, a much newer function that's probably one of the most important functions is um, understanding customers, so customer insights, and measurement of the interactions that um, our customers have with our company. Uh, my, my other, I would say, great um, uh, um, asset is we use all of our own technology to create all of our content, but also to measure the impact of all of our content. So we're probably the best evangelist for our own software at Adobe. Um, my organization has grown from 200 to 800 people in the last seven years. That's uh, mostly because we've chosen to insource a lot of the things that we do. We create almost all of our own content. We have one of the world's largest websites. We have a billion unique visitors per month coming to adobe.com. They come for all different kinds of reasons, but it's one of the largest corporate websites in the world. And I would say I have the most creative, analytical, hardworking team in technology. One of them is here with me today. So somebody asked me earlier today, what does your typical day look like? And um, it's a pretty crazy day. These are just some photos from um, you know, a typical day. So it's a wide spectrum of activities. There are a lot of meetings, and there are a lot of decisions to make. Um, we normally have a staff meeting. Um, so the executive team, there are 10 of us, including my boss. So we meet uh, on Mondays pretty much the whole day, but you know, also throughout the week. We look at our financials, we look at new product concepts, we look at how the business is doing. Um, so a lot of kind of reviews. Uh, I might go then into the next meeting, which is reviewing an ad campaign and a press release for one of our upcoming launches. I do a lot of reviewing. Yes, no, yes, no, that stinks, try it again, love it. Um, I do press interviews all the time, telling the story about our company and the transformation and new products and what our marketing group does. Um, promoting our story and our company's story is a huge part of my job. I write financial earnings scripts. So I know the finance majors are like, how do communication skills help? Well, when you're in finance, hopefully you'll have the joy of being able to write a financial earnings script someday. It is hard work. And I really have to know my stuff. I have to understand the financials really, really well. And I write the script along with our CEO, and obviously every single word matters when you are doing your earnings. Um, I spend a lot of time with my CFO, who's a very good friend of mine, and we're looking at the numbers, reviewing the impact of marketing performance on the bottom line. This is a topic my CFO loves a little too much. 
And so now that marketing is actually able to be measured in the way that it is, I mean, for a long time, marketers were kind of like the plankton of an organization. They were low, very low, because you couldn't measure the impact of what you were doing. Marketing were the people who were making all these pretty ads, but nobody really understood if it was having an impact. And finally, thanks to companies like Adobe, now you have data to help you understand, did that ad work? Do those people like that product feature? What are they saying about me on social media? Data enables you to have all these insights and then hopefully act upon those insights to make your products better, to make your service better, to make your company more beloved and your, your customers much more loyal to you. Um, the way the world is moving today, and this is something I've just really picked up on while I've been here today, disciplines are really blurring, and I think marketers need to know as much about finance, finance people know a lot about marketing, everybody should know how to write, IT people need to understand marketing, all these disciplines are blending together. And the focus here on interdisciplinary learning is just magnificent, and it will serve you very, very well. So um, the only way I think you can be successful today is through this interdisciplinary um, focus. So I encourage those of you who aren't taking classes outside of your discipline to do so, but I have to tell you how impressed I was. I was talking to people who have two majors plus another minor in a completely different uh, category, and I think that's, that's fantastic. So in addition to all that, I spend a lot of time with our customers, and that's probably the most valuable time of all because you never really know how your products are doing until you talk to real people. The data can tell you one thing, but you get in a room with a customer, an unhappy customer in particular, and you hear what their problem is, um, that's eye-opening. We at Adobe now have um, actually very disciplined ways, beyond all the data that we collect, to have face-to-face -face time with customers or phone time. And we now mandate that our employees listen in on customer service calls. Um, we also have kind of massive hackathons, so people get to participate in trying to break our products before we launch a new service. Um, and that mentality, that pushing to make sure that your customers are really happy with your products, that's become, I think, very important. In this age, when people are posting on social media every negative thing that they think about you, you better make sure that you understand what your customers are saying about you. And you may not always be able to improve upon it, but at least hear it, respond to it. That's what customers want today. Um, in addition to that, I serve on a number of boards. So I serve on the board of the Advertising Council. You may not have heard of the Advertising Council, but they're responsible for all the public service announcements in the United States. They started like 80 years ago with Smokey the Bear, and now they have everything, uh, campaigns on everything from not texting while you're driving, um, sexual harassment, anti-bullying, um, a, a particular campaign that we have invested in. They do really good work. Tomorrow is our big benefit where my um, boss is actually being honored as the humanitarian of the year because at Adobe we care really deeply about our communities and about um, young people in particular and helping them express themselves. That's kind of the mission of our whole company. I'm also on a public board. Difference between a nonprofit board and a public board. Public boards, the company makes money. And so it's a very different kind of um, an experience. Uh, you have to really have financial acumen. You are responsible to the shareholders of your company, uh, and you essentially run the company. The CEO of the company works for you. This was all very new to me. And it's also very different to be on a board than it is to actually operate your own business because there's a certain kind of arm's length distance when you're on a board. You're not managing that company day to day. You're advising. And this is kind of a natural progression, I think, when you've been in business a long time, to then become more of an advisor. So um, this is a role I really enjoy, and I love Mattel because it's toys. What could be more fun than toys? I was asked to be on a bunch of tech boards, and I'm like, I've been in tech for 30 years. I want to work on something that I feel is you know, a lot more fun and actually can have a huge impact, and that's toys. So it's been, it's been wonderful for me. And I also run our foundation. 
And at Intel, uh, excuse me, at Adobe, 1% of our net profits go into our foundation, and we use that money to help um, causes in our communities, but mostly uh, for our flagship um, charity, which is Project 1324. It's a new platform that hopefully someday all of you will use, uh, where you can share media, you create media, you share media, mostly on social causes, um, and uh, we're just looking to launch it probably over the next few months. We just did a, a kind of um, pilot, if you will, with Sundance, where we had a student film competition for kids 18 to 24. We received over 400 submissions, and we just had the five top winners come to our big creativity conference last week with Quentin Tarantino, and um, they uh, are, you know, hopefully going to become great filmmakers. So. These are the things that I basically spend my time doing. So, that's my story. Maybe I'll end with where I started, that there are these four key themes that hopefully you saw recurring throughout my life, and I still rely on these lessons every single day, and I'm choking up. Lehigh played a huge role in teaching them to me and shaping the leader that I am today. I can't believe I'm crying, what a baby. So, it's been um, an amazing journey, and again, I'm so grateful to all of you for coming, and to Don and John for inviting me. Thank you. I don't have a complete nervous breakdown. No, I'll do some no, kidding. No. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. you can stand here or you're welcome However to, you to sit. Whatever you want. Whatever sit. you like. All you're by certainly myself. our guest. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, we want to open up the microphones okay. now for some Q&A. There's a microphone here and there's a microphone there. So please don't be shy. Come down to the microphones. While people are coming down, um, I'll start off with a question that okay. struck me. Do you want me. me to come a little closer? <laughs> I don't have a mic. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck over here. How about if I just stand? It whatever, does, whatever you like. Yeah, it's a little lonely over there. <laughs> <laughs> here, you and I'll stand here. We'll stand together. Okay, or I'll stand. So when Adobe made the decision to, to switch from a subscription service, I'm sorry, from a, a um, we call it a perpetual, perpetual service to a yeah. subscription service. Yeah. What were some of the pushbacks that people within the company were, were voicing and how did you as a group overcome that resistance? Such a good question. So there was pushback internally and externally. Okay. So um, one of the biggest um, kind of problems that we foresaw is that our revenue was going to take a, a steep decline because we were not going to be collecting all the revenue up front. And so we had to go to Wall Street and explain what we were going to do very, very carefully with a lot of detail and um, essentially project for them when we thought that revenue would come back in. And so there was, there was some resistance about that. But there was resistance across the entire organization because we were going to, for instance, have to start marketing 24 hours a day rather than every 18 to 24 months. We were going to have to change um, all of our product SKUs, right? Because we would be shipping boxes, our channel, um, who we were you know, distributing through. They were very upset with us because that was their livelihood. Now we were going, in many cases, direct to the customer. Um, but our customers were also very resistant. There were huge portions of our customer base that liked receiving kind of that tangible box, and they felt that they, this decision was being forced upon them. And so we also had to anticipate what are, what are our customers going to feel. And I think we probably underestimated some of the negative reactions that customers would have to this. And in some markets, it was tremendous. Like right. in Germany, they were like, this is terrible, we hate the cloud, we don't want to do this. And still, the business is, you know, I would say, um, growing, but not as dramatically in some markets as it is in others. So, you know, when you transform a company, it, it runs across the spectrum. Everything changes, um, internally, externally, and, you know, we're still iterating, essentially, because um, the change is so profound. Right. Yeah, but we've done it. Yeah, sure. We're on the other end. <laughs> Yes. Does this work? Yes. Hi, sorry, my name is Aman. First of all, the first question, I'd like to thank you for coming to speak to us today. It was really nice. 
Um, my question is about uh, the stock valuation, interestingly. A lot of things that you mentioned today is what's driving the stock price. The last five years, they beat expectations. And now it's reached quite a high level. And you mentioned just now that uh, it's about going to Wall Street and explaining the transparency. But we see that some people are beginning to doubt whether earnings will fall given, um, I think right now it's, it's basically um, expectations from the cloud service, which, will, which is supposed to drive the earnings up. And that's beginning to take a bit of a, a washy look from Wall Street. I was wondering how you justify the, the valuations today. Wow. Well, obviously, I can't discuss anything, um, you know, um, confidential. But, you know, we think our valuation is completely um, uh, legitimate. And um, there's still a lot of growth that Adobe has. I mean, we forecast, again, 20% year-on-year growth overall from a revenue perspective. Our EPS, we're always on target. Our digital marketing business, which is kind of the newer business, is growing 25 to 30% annually. We're still bringing a lot more Creative Cloud customers in. Um, we went, as I said, from 3 million to 8 million, and there are a lot of other kind of markets, India and China. We just launched Creative Cloud last week in China for the first time, and we actually think a low price point may be um, the best, uh, finally, um, ammunition we have against piracy in some of these big markets. So we think there's a lot of uh, growth ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a good question. Well, I want you to go back to, oh, let's say 1980. Oh. Okay. I wish I could go back to 1980. <laughs> <laughs> what do you wish, if you were sitting in, these, in the audience, what do you wish you knew then that you know now um, about your career? Yeah. Or anything else you wish to divulge? <laughs> <laughs> I, a lot of things. Um, as I said, I, I had this mentor who, um, a man named Jim Jarrett, who's my first boss at, at Intel, and he, this is very sad, but says a lot about him. He died three years ago on the peak of Mount Kilimanjaro um, because he was the kind of man who was always doing incredible things, and he was a very adventurous soul. But I was very annoying, and I was always saying, I want to do this project. And like if somebody kind of did something I didn't like, I was saying, why are they doing that? And I was just um, animated. And he told me early on, Anne, you cannot go to the mat for everything. You really need to determine those things that are going to make the biggest difference for you and let some of this go. And um, I work on this every single day, literally. It's still hard for me. But I think it's a very important lesson in business because you will occupy all of your time fussing and fighting if you don't focus on kind of the critical things that need to get done. Yeah, that's, good. that's great advice. See, let's go over here and then over here. Sorry. Hi, my name's Kyle. I'd like to also thank you for coming here today. Um, the question I have for you is you mentioned that in the past, within the past seven to ten years, you guys at Adobe were able to execute a lot of vertical and horizontal integration with other companies. Mm -hmm. But you also said that you guys produce almost all of your own content. So I'm wondering how you transition between your acquisitions into in-house production. Yeah. So um, every, I would say pretty much every acquisition, we have a very, very high employee integration rate. There are a lot of companies in technology that acquire companies, and then they kind of carve out the employees, and they basically pay them out. We have, I would say, 80 to 90% um, employee integration. And we buy companies, back to that idea of, you know, having a good cultural fit and working well with people, we pick companies where we like the people. And we turn away companies that might actually, from a business perspective, make sense if we can't, we have actually done that with, if cultural fit doesn't work out. So integration is super important to us. In terms of insourcing content development, uh, I don't know that it works for every single company. At Adobe, it works really well because of the products that we have. So we can get really fabulous designers and really fabulous content people. And then we have the digital marketing tools as well. So we hire analysts, econometricians, um, data scientists, and we can get those people because they're working where this stuff is invented. And so I think you know it's a little maybe um, unique a situation but back to the employee integration, um, we keep all the marketing people. We just make sure they're the right people. Thank you. You're welcome. 
there was, Don, you're gonna ask a question? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, the, the light hit me. I didn't see that it was <laughs> <It's> Don. <Dawn. laughs> and uh, I don't want to encroach on privacy, and, uh, but I'm just curious. Being a finance guy and listening to you touch on momentarily on earnings reporting, can you possibly summarize Ann Lunas's day on earnings reporting? Oh, so it's or, actually. Is that okay? Sure. It's actually a lot longer than one day, sadly. So um, we are uh, we are a very um, disciplined company, and I think that's why we get rewarded by Wall Street. So um, the earnings process begins in earnest, probably. Um, one to two weeks before the actual earnings announcement. And we have a head of investor relations who's responsible. He's the guy who talks to the street every day. We have our CFO, myself, um, our chief counsel, and um, then um, our, our CEO. That's really kind of the, the core team. And then I have a writer who basically does a, a first draft of how the business is doing without any numbers because we're very... Um, uh, I would say rigorous about not re letting a lot of people in on the numbers until right at the end. And so um, the process is uh, to have a recording of the earnings read. It's, it's, I don't think, always typical of this, but we write the script and Shantanu and I um, do his part of the script and then the CFO and um, the investor relations guy do the financials, but we review them as a team. So I'm involved in the entire process, wordsmithing, positioning, how will this play? Um, let's say this, I don't know. So probably five days of that, it's quite a long process. Um, and then it's pre-recorded the, um, the day before, and then, um, oh, excuse me, the morning before, because we release at 1.10 p.m. on um, a Tuesday or Thursday, typically. So we pre-record it so that the, um, the focus can be really on the Q&A, because that's the most important part. The script is already predetermined. We put it on a website. We fact check it. We have FAQs, uh, frequently asked questions. And then the call is probably the most important part. That's an hour after the release of the financial earnings. This might be too much information, but I'll tell you since you asked. Uh, and then um, we do press, and then we do call downs with the financial analysts to explain kind of um, more information if they want it. But the call, that one hour, an hour after the press release drops, is kind of the critical time because the CEO and the CFO get on the phone and they answer questions from a group of um, analysts. And that's how it works. Now, interestingly, there, um, uh, because the press release drops right at um, 1.10 after market close, there's often like a little blip in the stock or a little dip in the stock because the press release goes out and people sell or buy based on that press release. And then over the course of that next hour, um, when the call actually occurs, the stock moves a ton because all the questions are being answered by the CEO and the CFO. So you see a real difference in those first five minutes, and I'm always telling them, don't look for five minutes. Do not <laughs> look. Um, let's wait till two o'clock to make an assessment because it's during that one hour period and the call downs after market that the, you know, the stock goes up or down. Right. Hi, my name is Roger. I just wanted to thank you again for coming uh, today. My question is, what advice would you give to a small business company that's looking to pivot in a completely new direction with regards to its marketing and advertising strategy? Is it your small business company? It's a project that I'm working on <laughs> with uh, Professor Costa over here. It's, it's a friend. I'm talking for a friend. <laughs> well, um, we love small businesses in Silicon Valley. Um, obviously, it's a startup culture. and. Um, what I would say is it's, it's a great time to be um, a, an entrepreneur because from a marketing perspective, you can market yourself. This used to be something that was very difficult to do. There are countless stories of companies that have gone big just from social media. Um, and uh, you know, I, would, I, I think the number one thing you can do is promote the heck out of yourself. Um, you know, the second thing I would do is find um, people who can um, advise you 
um, because there are a lot of people who love to advise students and young small businesses. That's something you know, both that recent grads love to do, people like myself, I do it all the time. And um, I think advice from seasoned business folks is very important to what your business plan ultimately becomes. And you need a great business plan. You know, the folklore in Silicon Valley is you come in and you say, ah, I don't know how I'm going to make money, but I have a great idea. No, I think those days are kind of over. You need a solid business plan, and that means advice. And you need a little seed money if you have a good idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Jennifer Cunningham. I've been tweeting you uh, the last few days, so oh, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. Uh, um, so I'm the alumni director here, and I think a lot about uh, the great education that students are getting now, but I also worry about the education that they'll get after they come out of Lehigh, and being that Adobe is so progressive in terms of your policies and, and all of that, can you talk a little bit about what Adobe does for leadership training ongoing and how important that is? Um, and also, if there's anything special that you do for um, female leaders in the tech business. First, these are like set up. These are softball questions. <laughs> so um, people resources, human resources at Adobe is crazy good. I was at a semiconductor company, and basically the only time you ever saw HR was when they were firing you. And so when I got to <laughs> Adobe, and I was like surrounded by all these people resources, it was kind of scary to me. The first thing they did was they focused on integration, and it's back to that um, word of integration. The first thing my HR person told me is, um, when you're here, we don't want you to assimilate, because that means we would make you into who we are. We want to integrate you so that you bring the best of yourself and you take the best of us. And I was like, who are these people? <laughs> but that's literally how the company runs, and it's all about integration. Um, from a leadership standpoint, we have all different levels of leadership training. So um, we pick some of our prized kind of um, budding senior managers. We have um, a course that's developed with UC Berkeley from the Haas School, and we do an intact one week with them, and they, um, they are each assigned projects, which they work on there and then follow up on as well, and they present them to executive staff. Um, we have middle management training programs. We have online training that's mandatory um, across a lot of different, from sexual harassment to um, um, uh, social governance, all, and depending on what your area of discipline is, there's a ton of online training. Um, in terms of diversity, we have um, some great programs. We had our first ever women's leadership forum a couple of months ago. We had 500 women come from around the world to um, San Jose, where our headquarters is. It's the first time we ever had these women. And um, I didn't mention diversity is a huge issue in technology in Silicon Valley. Uh, in um, our company, as in most, uh, we have about 30% to 40% women, and in engineering, we have 20% or less. So it's really bad, and in some regions, it's even worse. And so um, this was the first time we ever brought all these women together. It was just fantastic. We had Samantha B. We had Brene Brown, who's this incredibly inspiring leader. I don't know if you know her, and she talked all about her journey. And then we had some of our senior leader women talk about what they do. Um, Pooja, who's here with me today, is part of a program called Women Unlimited. And that is a kind of, again, hand-selected program where um, these female leaders from different companies in um, the Valley meet with executives, whether it's me or other, and not just females, but they learn kind of um, leadership skills by studying others and by also doing coursework. So we're doing a lot, but we have not done enough. And diversity is still an issue in tech in Silicon Valley, and we're trying to work on it. So females, come to Silicon Valley. That's the message. <laughs> well, I, I've learned so, so very much. And thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much for what having me. What an outstanding really presentation. Honored. We're not done yet. Oh, we're not done yet. OK. Okay. Don and Judy, thank you for making this possible. And I would like to welcome Don back up. Okay. We have party gifts. Oh, party gifts. Okay. <laughs> I got the loveliest pillow today from 
the marketing and finance group. Thank you. They're sending it back a nice Lehigh pillow. Thank you. <laughs> Don, would you like to do the honors? And on behalf of the college, of Judy and myself, this is for you. Thank you. And you did an absolutely fabulous job. Thank you, Don. And it's a little on the heavy side. My goodness, what is this? Old boy, yeah. Is it 33 years worth? Oh, by the way, we're, <laughs> we're supposed to look at the camera and smile. Oh, we're supposed to look at the camera and smile. Oh, my goodness. Look at this beautiful thing. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so cute. That's gorgeous. Enjoy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Good luck to all of you. Would you like this scent? Thank you all for coming. I know that I learned a lot. I hope you did, too. And happy end of semester.